Welcome to Changing Higher Ed, a podcast dedicated to helping higher education leaders improve their institutions. My name is Dr. Drum McNaughton, and I'm the CEO of The Change Leader, a management consultancy that helps university leaders create sustainable higher ed institutions through holistic approaches to strategic management, university academics and operations, change management, leadership, and governance. Our podcast brings you the latest in higher ed news, as well as some of the top experts in our profession who will share with you their perspectives on how you can grow your institution. This being our last episode of the year, we're going to do things a bit differently and establish what we hope to be a new tradition at the Changing Higher Ed podcast, an episode in which we look back at the year in higher ed, and then we'll get out the crystal ball and make prognostications for 2019. Helping me with this is TCL's Deb Maui, our marketing and positioning expert, who will for a change be putting me on the hot seat. Hi, Drum. Hey, Deb. How you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Good. Happy holidays. Happy holidays to you. So this is going to be interesting for you because you're normally in the interviewer seat, and today you get to be in the interviewee seat. Yes, uh, I'm quaking in my boots. You're tough. <laughs> I'll try to go easy on you. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. You know, we can all use easy once in a while. Yes, yes. So I hope your holidays are are going well so far. It's hard to believe that we're in December again, isn't it? I, I think as I get older, the time just gets goes by faster and faster. I, I, I'm not sure where Einstein's special relativity comes into play with that one, but I'm sure it does. I agree. I feel like I blinked and it was, you know, the holidays again. But here we are. You know, what you, what you always could do is just leave all your decorations up the entire <laughs> year and just change the tree out every two months. Well, you know, my hus- that would make my husband very, very happy. I'm not going to tell him that you suggested that because he'll, <laughs> he'll take you up on it. So December, in addition to, to uh, enjoying the holidays, December is a good time to kind of stop and take a pause and look back on the year. And so as you and I discussed for this podcast, it seems like a a good thing to do uh, to look back on the year in higher ed and look at what the major developments were, identify some trends, and and then also get out the crystal ball and look forward to see what what we think is going to happen in 2019. So does that sound good? It sounds like a great plan. And I'll tell you, there's an awful lot of gifts under the tree, but there's also a lot of lumps of coal. Yeah. Well, I hope that mine's a gift and not a lump of coal. So, Of course. For you, always. (laughs) Okay. So here we go. I guess the obvious first question is, is what do you see as the biggest developments that happened in higher ed in 2018? Well, I think there's probably three. Isn't there always three things? That always three. Yep. Absolutely. And so I think, you know, the first of those is the closings and the mergers. I mean, over the last couple of years, more than 100 for-profit and career colleges have closed between 2016 and 2018. Uh, a lot of that had to do with ACICS Uh, the accreditation body being decertified by the Obama administration. And we'll come back to that because the Trump administration has recertified it. But that's that's a whole other story. You've got 65 for-profits closed and seven mergers. And some of those mergers are huge. Uh, You've got Purdue acquiring Kaplan. You've got Strayer acquiring Capella National University System, which is a nonprofit out of the San Diego area, has just finished their acquisition of North Central, a for-profit online university. So we're seeing a lot of mergers and acquisitions, and it makes perfect sense given where we are in the, the product life cycle, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But in addition to, you know, for-profits, you've got 14 nonprofits uh, who have closed, you've got five mergers, and you've got 36 publics who have merged or consolidated. So there's a lot of stuff going on in higher ed from mergers and closings. Were there any of those that you looked at that you've read about that you you found surprising that you you think this is one that made the wrong decision to close or close too early? Or do you think that they were all really at the point where they had no choice? 
you know, without going through and taking a look at the financials, I, I can't really comment. Obviously, nobody wants to close a college because, you know, it really hurts the students. It hurts the institution, these type of things. Uh, some of the mergers have surprised me, uh, Strayer and Capella being one. But in, in some ways, it surprises me. But in other ways, it really doesn't. Because as you get into a mature market, which higher ed clearly is, price reductions, mergers, acquisitions, the consolidation are all part of the hallmarks of a, a saturated or a mature market. Do you think that the um, expansion of uh, community colleges and the fact that in many states, community colleges are, are able to offer four-year degrees, do you, do you think that that is having an effect and contributing to some of the mergers and closings that we're seeing? I think to some degree, uh, degree completion is a big part of higher ed at this point. And especially with the advent of the post-traditional students, those students who are coming back to school after being away. Um, we had a podcast with Carol Aslanian on those students a few weeks back. The degree completion is big. You know, there was a stat that just came out uh, for folks who have completed a two-year college versus is none, no college. And the statistics, you know, the average person makes about $4,600 a year versus someone who's got the two-year, it's 7100 So it's, you make mu- that much more having the degree. And then when you factor in the four-year degree, it's even more than that. And so that's one of the big reasons people are going back to school. And it makes perfect sense, especially in the, uh, the market that we are. One of the other things that I'm seeing with community or, or technical colleges, uh, there's something that UC is doing, and you know, good on Governor Brown, whether you like him or not, he uh, is holding up $50 million from the UC system until the uh, system meets the auditor request. Some of that was accounting things, but a lot of it has to do with increasing its share of transfer students. They made a promise to uh, the transfer, you know, the students and the, uh, the community colleges that there would be a two to one ratio of freshmen to transfer students. And a couple of the colleges like Santa Cruz, UC Santa Cruz and UC Riverside were 3.3 and 4.4 to one respectively. And we're also seeing a lot of colleges, privates who are co-locating with community colleges, renting space from them, giving a direct track for those students directly to their four-year degree. So we're seeing some interesting things out there with respect to the community colleges. Does more need to be done? Absolutely. Especially when you think of it in light of the high cost of education nowadays. I saw one private college right now whose four-year degree is up at, when you figure in tuition plus fees, it's up at 55000 a year. And this isn't an Ivy League. This is another university. And so that's unsustainable. So giving students a lower cost bridge, community college to a UC to another private college, it certainly cuts down on the amount of money that they have to borrow to complete their degree. Yeah, it seems like that that's the key is providing community college students with a clear pathway, depending on the degree that they want or the area of interest that they have, providing that clear pathway, not only what classes to take while they're at community college, but how they can actually transfer easily to a four-year institution, making sure that all of their credits transfer so that they can really minimize the time to completion and also their cost. Absolutely, which is another argument for accreditation, because if you're an accredited school, you should be able to transfer credit hours. Now, sometimes the regionals will go, no, don't think so, uh, or schools that are regionally accredited, don't think so, this isn't quite at our, quote, standard. But as a general rule, if you're accredited by one of the 22 or 23 different accreditation bodies here in the U.S., your credits should be able to transfer. Community colleges, especially, you know, if we use University of California, which for a number of years had the top system in the country, 
that is the, the gold standard of being able to transfer directly into one of the state schools. So last year, or I can't remember if it was last year or the year before, when Sweetbriar closed, the alumni mounted a, a fundraising campaign to keep it open. And so far, it looks like that's been successful. It doesn't appear that something similar has happened with the closings that we've seen in this past year. Have you seen any of the, the closings that are likely to be, be turned around based on a similar program? I've not read anything about that. And Sweetbriar was kind of an interesting, I don't want to call it an experiment because it's a you know wonderful school, but they had a very substantial endowment, which was earmarked for certain things legally, and they couldn't use that money for operating funds. That was a mistake on the board of trustees to, to do that type of thing. But Sweetbriar, whereas it's not come roaring back, I think one of the things that's helped Sweetbriar is the Me Too movement, because Sweetbriar remains to this day an all-woman's college. And so, you know, who's to say that that hasn't helped it as well? But uh, Sweetbriar, I think, is a is an interesting case. Uh, I think it'll at business schools, I think it'll make a, a great case study on, you know, what to do, what not to do, but involving their stakeholders, their alumni, to bring it back from the dead was a, was a great thing to do. Yeah. Okay. So the first major trend is, is closings and mergers. What's the second one? Well, I think the second has to come out of Washington. And the whole, I don't want to call it debacle, but the whole interesting issue of ACICS. As you recall, ACICS had its ability to accredit universities taken away by the Obama administration. And then when Secretary DeVos came in uh, after about a year, she went ahead and said, okay, we're going to more than likely return it back to accreditation status. One of the challenges with this, uh, the Ed Department senior official for accreditation is a woman who worked for for profits the majority if not all of her career and was actually a lobbyist for the for profit universities so she had come out and said that the obama administration was wrong that they determined that acics was in compliance on 19 of the 21 applicable criteria and they said it was likely in compliance uh, with these criteria when uh, Secretary King, who was the Education Department Secretary under Obama administration, when the, he removed uh, ACICS, ACICS's accreditation. Now, this was a major thing. Right. Yeah, you saw Corinthian and ITT go under. ACICS accredited 200 plus universities, and most of those had two to three years to go and get accreditation from another accreditation body. We just saw in the last week or so, uh, the Education Corporation of America close its doors almost immediately with, with no teach-out plans, nothing, which is something that is required if you're going to shutter a school. They just shut the doors. And to those students, it's like, okay, sorry, what's going to happen to them? Now, one of the things with Virginia College was they went to another accreditor and attempted to get uh, accreditation from them and failed miserably in that. So how they can say that ACI, well, and, and in, in fairness to ACICS, ACICS came back and removed Virginia College's accreditation as well. Maybe ACICS has gotten better. They're still, quote, out of compliance in two areas but they've been given another 12 months to come back into compliance. We'll have to wait and see. But that, to me, is probably the, the second biggest news that we've seen out of, out of Washington or, or anywhere. So do you think that this change will help uh, for profits at this point? Or do you think it's, it's kind of, you know, the damage is done and it's sort of too late to turn things around? I don't know. Sorry, I'm moving on to predictions. I'm not supposed to move on to predictions. Yet. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> My crystal ball is really cloudy on that one. Okay. Well, I'm hoping it gets clearer in the next few minutes. Well, I hope so too. But in just looking at it, for-profits have gotten themselves a very, very bad rap. 
I remember reading something earlier this year that, that basically said those people with a four-year degree from a for-profit university, they're not making any more than they would if they hadn't gone to college. I mean, that's pretty damning uh, it certainly is. statement. The other thing, too, is, and this is kind of an adjunct to the ACICS, it's all information coming out of the Department of Ed, the Gainful Employment and Borrower Defense Rules. The Education Department missed the filing deadline for the gainful employment, and so the changes that they want to make can't really come into play until in mid-2020, except that because there's an interagency dispute over data sharing, i.e. the Social Security Administration, which provides the earnings data, they have decided that they are not going to renew the information sharing agreement that they had with the Department of Education. That expired in May. And so, in essence, there is nothing that the Department of Ed can do unless there's a change of regulation. The Department of Ed can't do another debt to earning rates, which means gainful employment is essentially debt. They don't have the data to do that. Now, personally, I think it shouldn't just be limited to for profits. I think the gainful employment rule should be applied to all education institutions. It is a metric that students should know is, okay, if I go back to school, what are my chances of getting a degree and or not a degree, a job with my degree, and how much money am I going to make against how much student loans I've had to take out? To me, that is a, a normal metric, but I can't think of anyone who really likes to be held accountable, but then that goes in spades for higher ed in- institutions. True. The other side of it, of course, is that it's kind of like when you buy a car and the car doesn't perform well. Is it because of the car or is it because of driver error? What are you bringing to the table as a student matters a lot in what you get out of, of higher education. So that's, that's the other side of the argument that colleges and universities have is, well, you, you can't hold us completely accountable for the student outcomes because it's largely about what the students put into it. You're absolutely right. But that's why you have a A, B, C, D, F grade scale. And if a student doesn't meet the standards, then should they pass? I think what we found is because of graduation rates, things along those lines, that some of those standards have been relaxed. And so we're graduating students that are not as well prepared as they used to. Of course, that also has to do with the marketplace. You know, there's a lot of folks out there who are saying we are not preparing students well enough for the marketplace. Everything is changing so fast. I mean, a a plug for a book uh, by Thomas Friedman, Thank You for Being Late, talks about the acceleration of technology and how we as human beings are unable at this point to keep up with that acceleration. So how can you actually prepare a student to be, quote, up to speed when everything is accelerating as fast as it is and it's a moving target? I mean, you can make arguments on both sides of the fence. Well, and that's an argument for lifelong learning, right? That we have to stop thinking about college as a four-year thing and realize, and then, you know, thinking that that's when your education stops and really look at it as a really a continuous thing throughout your your life or or at least your working life when you're going to have to keep updating your skills. Absolutely. And with that same concept, I like what Texas A&M has done. Again, a plug for one of the uh, the guests on the previous podcast, Dan Pugh, who's the vice president for student affairs at uh, Texas A&M. The joke around A&M is what do you call an Aggie five years after they graduate? I don't know. What do you call them? Boss. What Texas A&M does is they put students into leadership positions their entire way through their program. They believe not only in educating the intellect, but in educating the whole student, which is one of those trends that I hope that we're going to get back to is 
the purpose of higher ed is not just preparing people for jobs, it's preparing people for life. One part of that is lifelong learning. Agreed. You prefaced your second trend of the year, you know, calling the trend Washington. So under that category, we've got ACICS. What else would you put under that general trend of Washington that had an effect on higher ed? Well, the gainful employment rule, the borrower defense, which we talked a little bit about. But the last one really brings us into the third piece of that, which has to do with Title IV, uh, Michigan State, sexual abuse, and the Me Too movement. Title IV or Title IX? Title IX, thank you. It's the other four plus one. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Anyway, you know, it's, it's interesting. We, we take a look at what's happened. With the Title IX, the Ed Department has put out their draft ruling, which, you know, hopefully they'll, they'll make some changes to it. Colleges are not happy. The challenge with it is they've changed the standard by which they, they've changed four main things. One, they've changed the standard by which any kind of sexual assault can be uh, adjudicated. One has to do with the proving. The proving where it was, it used to be there was a good likelihood that it happened. It's now gone up to the same standard as it was with a civil suit, you know, the preponderance of evidence. It's not beyond reasonable doubt. It's preponderance of evidence. Now, in the guidance, they say that, yes, you know, you can use the other standard if you want. But that, to me, I think that's going to leave institutions open to lawsuits by accused people if they use the wrong standard. Okay, that's one piece of it. Another piece is they have in some ways absolved universities for responsibility because instead of just reporting the victim, reporting it to anyone, they have to report it to someone who can do something about it. And along those same lines, the accused has a chance to cross-examine the victim. And they're feeling like these two things will discourage victims from coming forward and reporting incidents. I mean, it's a kettle of fish. It is a kettle of fish. Anytime you get into these kind of things, it's got to be more than he said, she said. But that's what ultimately it could come down to because of this cross-examination piece of it. It used to be when a woman would accuse a man of sexual assault, rape, whatever, the woman was the one who was on trial because of her dress or her her behaviors or or whatever. And there's genuine concern out there in in the lawyer front that it's going to turn back into that same very thing. Well, the challenge is really, it's he said, she said, because most of the time there are only two people in the room. And that's why it's so difficult, because often there's not any evidence other than what each person is saying. Very true. I mean, this this came to the forefront uh, with the uh, Supreme Court hearings with uh, Justice Kavanaugh and the woman from Palo Alto University. A tremendous amount of courage she had to have to bring this up after so many years. But look, ultimately, what happened to me? It was one of those things that the good old boys network just kind of took over and and derailed the entire investigation before it was able to go through to a true conclusion. Right. And so we're seeing also fallout at Michigan State. Uh, The former president was hit with felony charges a few weeks back for lying to the police. I mean, that's not good either. And the fallout from this kind of thing is also their enrollment, undergraduate applications for Michigan State have fallen by eight, almost eight and a half percent in the wake of the scandal. So it's not only hitting them from a reputation perspective, it's hitting them in the pocketbook perspective as well. And maybe that's what has to happen for people to change. I don't know. The other piece with this is, and I don't think we've seen this quite yet, although we've seen, we've seen some indications of it, is where is the board of directors, the board of regents, the board of trustees? We saw some of them with the Penn State scandal. We saw some of them being brought up on charges. Uh, We haven't seen that yet with the Michigan State 
scandal. But will we? They've done, and their interim president there has not done the greatest job when it comes to reaching out to the victims. It's been pretty nasty in many respects. And so what's going to happen with the Board of Regents for there? You know, most state schools are political appointee. You know, it's a feather in my cap to be on a the Board of Regents or the Board of Trustees for a state university. Does there need to be more education boards, boards of regents in particular with public universities about what their role is? Because it seems like you have two kind of two ends of the spectrum. You've got Michigan State where it seems like the board either didn't know what was going on or or turned a blind eye to it. And then on the other hand, you have overreaching, as we saw at the University of Maryland, with the firing or not firing, as it were, of the, the football coach after the player died. It seems to me like a lot of these boards don't really understand what their role is. I think you're absolutely right, Deb. I don't think they understand their fiduciary duties, which is a legal term. And it's duty of care, duty of loyalty, duty of obedience. But more than that, I think the model has changed for the way boards should work. It used to be that you'd have the board go through the administration who would then talk with all the stakeholders. But given you know, the multiple things that have happened, you know, Penn State, Michigan State, And so many other things where the board has been blindsided or turned a blind eye, that model has to change to where the board is talking with stakeholders, both inside and outside the university, to keep a pulse on what's going on. Now, it becomes a very delicate dance between allowing the president of the university to run the university as as he or she feels is correct. But at the same time, the board can't micromanage. But if they're not getting the information, I mean, right now, there's one state university that I know of that the president refuses to talk to the board. I mean, that's a recipe for disaster. It certainly is. And so what do you do about that? It is a politically appointed board, but they still have to have that that dialogue because ultimately it's the board of regents who are responsible for the financial sustainability and the functioning of the university. Right. So we've covered a lot of ground um, in terms of the developments um, from 2018. We've got the closings and the mergers. We've got things coming out of Washington, ACICS, and Title IX. Any other big trends or developments that you want to talk about from 2018? Well, I think the one that is still undecided is how it's going to fall out is the Harvard lawsuit. A group of Asian Americans have sued Harvard as far as their admissions policies. And maybe we just expand that into race relations. I mean, Mm -hmm. back years ago at St. Louis University, I said years ago, it was three or four years ago, they had race riots that were there. And, you know, this race still continues to play into higher ed uh, as far as equal opportunities, as far as the the balancing of the uh, monies. I'm searching for the for the right term. It's income inequality is what I'm looking for. Right. There's all of those things, but I just read something about a black university professor eating in the cafeteria and a white professor called him or her out, should you be eating here? I mean, it's like Ugh. the headline was another case of eating while black. Right. And eating while black, studying while black. Yeah. It goes the list goes on and on. It does. And so even though Harvard, you know, says they're following the the guidance that came out of the Supreme Court, they get sued. I think USC or UCLA, I can't remember, one of the the major colleges in Southern California, same kind of thing. I I think it may be UCLA, same sort of thing. There's a a group of students that are are suing as far as admission policies. Uh, I don't think we've seen the end of this. And The free speech movements were the big things for a couple of years ago with Milo Yiannopoulos and and some of those Mm -hmm, other mm -hmm. folks. Uh, I think equality, income equality, race equality, and even sexual preference. The Department of Ed is, they're talking about removing the the equality for the LBGTQ, and that's going to be another 
major issue that comes up, I think. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, It seems like the ship has kind of sailed on a lot of these issues, I hope anyway, that you can't turn back the clock and and go back to the the way things were as, as much as people try. But it will be very interesting to see what happens with all these things. Yeah, it's certainly been a year of headlines. Let's put it that way. Certainly has. Okay, so let's get out the crystal ball and um, wipe it off so that it's... um... I'm dusting it off. Yeah, I'm dusting it off as we speak. Okay. Oh, mirror, mirror, mirror on the wall. (laughs) (laughs) Wait, you're mixing mixing fairy tales. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) You know, there's a lot of fairy tales that are going on in Washington right now, but let's not go there. Unfortunately, I think there's still some fairy tales in in higher ed as well, but um, that's a topic for another day, probably. So, all right. So, predictions for next year. What do you see coming? Well, I think the what we're seeing is we're seeing an industry that is in the mature to declining phases. Uh, I take a look at it from a marketing perspective, something that I know you know quite a bit about, those four stages to the product life cycle, introduction, growth, maturity, and then decline. And we're seeing a lot of the signs that higher ed is in a maturity to decline phase. And let me, let me go into that a little bit more. Just in the last couple of weeks, Moody's Investor Service and Fitch Ratings have both declared negative outlook for the higher ed sector for 2019. I mean, this is huge. That's huge. So what we're seeing in the maturity, we're seeing saturation. Now, how many MBAs do we need in this country? Really? And, you know, how many MBAs? Particularly with technology, the way it is. You know, not every school has to offer everything. Exactly. And so what we're seeing, the the smarter schools are focusing on the positioning and the differentiation. You know, why is my degree different? You've got some great poster children for that. Um, You've heard me speak of Carnegie Mellon or MIT or, you know, universities like that who have picked something and this is what they're known for. That's one, one way to combat this, but not a lot of schools understand marketing, positioning, differentiation. Also, if I can interrupt you too, it's also, if you look at what's happening in the state of Pennsylvania right now um, with their state university system, and it's my home state, so, you know, I have a soft spot in my heart for it. But, you know, you have 21, I think, state universities, not including Penn State and Pitt and Temple, and they're all vying for a smaller and smaller number of students graduating from high school. But the challenge is that they're not only educating students, but they're also major employers because most of them are in small towns and they're, they're the major employer in town. So you're potentially affecting many, many jobs by consolidating degrees or by saying each university is going to specialize in a certain number of things and not offer others. And there's a huge battle going on because of it. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, this even comes into, and of course, we were going to get into shared governance with this. Right. You know, with shared governance, faculty are supposed to be responsible for curriculum. But the, the challenge is, is they're looking at it through a very narrow lens instead of looking at what does the market need as far as where's the job market going? What kind of skills does the job market need? they're not looking at it from this perspective and that's hurting the colleges as well. The other thing that we we see in a mature market is we see price discounts, discounting. And, you know, when I take a look at, at research from the uh, inside higher ed, they do an annual survey on the, the college business officers or chief business officers, the CFOs. And the, la- the latest one that they had come out, it said 48% of all uh, CBOs, the college business officers, it's up from 34% in 2003. They strongly agree or agree their college tuition discount rate is unsustainable. And then, you know, two thirds of the, the privates say the same thing. I mean, this is huge. You cannot continue to discount your tuition 
you've got to make some cuts along the way in programs that are not, quote, profitable. And what happens is you end up getting faculty very angry and they come up with a vote of no confidence against the president. When the president may be just trying to make the university keep support. the doors open. It, exactly. Basically. Given the current environment and the life stage of higher ed, do you see the number of closings accelerating in the coming year? Do you think we'll see more closings in 2019 than we did in 2018? I think so, but I think there is going to be a shift with the closings. I think we're going to see more and more consolidation rather than just outright closings. We're going to see more mega universities, which is very typical in a a mature market. You see uh, conglomerates. And there's, you know, I think we're going to see more shared services. The challenge is going to be, though, is for the smaller universities, the ones that don't have good endowments, what are they going to do? Uh, Most of these universities are in tuition only or or very, you know, they don't have a lot of research dollars coming in like your your tier one or your R1s do. And so they're totally dependent on tuition for keeping their doors open. And so what are they going to do? Uh, You know, the the current closure rate right now is below 1%, but I think it will accelerate. The one wild card in this and, and you and I have spoken about this, was those go-go years back, you know, 10 to 15 years ago. And that accelerated in some ways through the Great Recession. Yes, costs went up because they weren't getting as much state support as they did. But with more people out of work, they will want to go back and get a different degree, something that will help them get a job. And maybe that will help the universities. There's some wild cards in there, though, with the the demographics. And the other one, which we've not talked about, is how many people are disparaging higher ed and saying the college degree isn't worth the money that you pay for it or the paper it's printed on. And so is this, in fact, going to hurt higher ed and its ability to bring in more students? My crystal ball is cloudy on that one. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because you do hear in the news all the time that that surveys that people don't think higher ed's on the right track and don't think a higher ed degree is worth it. But then if you ask individual people, do you want your child to go to college, they still overwhelmingly say yes. So I think that there's a skepticism about the industry as a whole. But when you look at it on an individual level, I think people still kind of, they know in their gut that going to college is a good thing. The the single biggest addition to the gross national product that we have is education. And I don't see that changing in any time soon. Now, I think the way that we do education has to change. I think folks have been locked up in the ivory tower for too long, and it's time they started getting out and understanding what industry needs as far as the degrees, what what they need to be taught. You know, Texas A&M, again, is another really good example of this. They have stakeholder groups that they talk with. They just went through and did a, a huge values survey, and they're looking at Aggie, I think it's 2030. You know, what's the future of the university going to be and where we're going? I mean, this is these are the type of things that universities need to be doing with their alumni, with their stakeholders, with the people who hire their graduates. Now, there's another trend that we're seeing, and I think a lot of this has to do with demographics as well as with costs, is students seem to be making decisions as far as attending a college a lot based on the proximity that they are to that college. And I think this is an important thing for universities to realize is unless you are an R1 or a major university, more than likely your students are going to come from a limited geographical pool. And so why are you expending marketing monies to go out to other areas that you're not getting as good a return on? Well, and speaking as a parent um, who has gone through this process with my daughter, I can tell you there are a lot of 
institutions that are wasting marketing dollars on that. I mean, you know, she got mailings from places all over the country that we'd never even heard from that she heard of that she would never consider going to. So I agree with you. You really have to, you know, as much as as institutions would like to draw from a larger geographical area, you have to know what you are. You have to know where your students come from. And first and foremost, try to get more students from that area, you know, fish where the fish are, because it's, like you said, it's just a waste of money. Absolutely. And so I think this is one of the changes we're going to start seeing. I I certainly hope so. I think we're going to also start seeing, you know, far more cost containment which, you know, this is part of the the positioning and the marketing to limited geographical areas. But one of the things that I see good promise in, and many faculty are not going to be happy that I say this, is online programs, although that's beginning to get saturated as well. Well, I think when you were talking about the consolidations that happen in a mature market, I think we're likely to see that happening with the online providers as well. I think we're likely to see a lot of, um, you know, mergers and acquisitions in that area because there are so many providers, you know, the the learning houses, the, you know, the Kaplan's, the ones who are doing the the nuts and bolts. I think we're going to see consolidation in that area as well. I, I think you're right. And, and the other thing, you know, when I think about what are the reasons that there is a consolidation or a merger, it's usually one of three reasons. One, it's because you're trying to get a particular technology. And you know, if I take a look at National University, they just acquired somebody who has a fabulous LMS, learning management system for online students. So that, that's one. The other is you're, you're going for a particular demographic of a student or, you know, a product, you know, where's your customer? And so, you know, again, I look at National University, they want to expand more into the online area. So they've required uh, North Central, which has a very, you know, they're all online. So they're acquiring that population. The other is you normally acquire to eliminate competition. And so we saw that in some cases with, I think it was UMass, Boston, and Mount Ida. They eliminated competition there. And so we're going to see a lot more of this, I think. Another thing we're going to see is people sharing, the embracing the sharing of online courses. Now, this kind of brings us into an interesting area. The 2019 NEGREG, the negotiated rulemaking, which is the process that the Department of Education uses to put forth new, new regulations. That's starting up in January, and it's focused on two areas with some subcategories. The first, you know, the two areas is accreditation and innovation, and the subcategories are online education, credit hour. I think we're going to start seeing more folks using uh, CBE, those type of programs where looking at previous learning and giving credit for it. Now, that's going to be a little challenging until they change the uh, regulations around credit hour. But I think we're going to start seeing some more of that coming forward. And if you take a look at at two colleges who have done very well, actually three colleges who have done very well with that, you've got Western Governors, who's really the poster child for CBE. Capella has done very well doing that. And then there's another college back east, and the name has has slipped my mind, who is also- Southern New Hampshire? Now that's it, Southern New Hampshire. Yeah. They're mm-hmm. also doing quite a bit of it as well. So there's another program coming up. You're going to start seeing, I think, cities getting more and, and state municipalities getting into higher ed and the funding. You know, City of Chicago announced a new program where students are going to receive scholarships to cover costs of associate degrees that'll be set up through DePaul University. Yep. And those folks. My former employer. Woohoo. Yeah. And and so (laughs) there's that. I think the other thing is we're going to start seeing some changes. And it was an interesting article that came out. The Netherlands is radically shaking up how the academics, the faculty are promoted and and assessed. And they're, they're moving away from relying on citations and publications and looking at it from a teaching perspective. I mean, Tenure initially was to give those folks who did research protection, and it's morphed into, you know, so they wouldn't lose their job. Yeah, it's morphed into a job for life. 
Exactly. And so I think what we're going to start seeing is a review of tenure every 10 years, five to 10 years. So it'll be more of a contract basis. And I think they're going to have to start looking at teaching versus just research. So I take it you don't see tenure going away anytime soon. I really don't. I think it's too institutionalized. Take a look at what Wisconsin under Scott Brown has tried to do with tenure. And the faculty have totally been in arms about the whole thing. Scott Walker, not Scott Brown. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. They're our neighbor to the north. I'm very familiar with Wisconsin. Yeah. So, you know, there's other things that are that are going on. You've got, you know, the badges, the MOOCs, certificates, degrees. I don't think badges are going to get a lot of traction. You know, I think the badges are the, the MOOCs of a couple of years ago. There's going to be a few that, that come forward, but I, I don't think it's going to be, uh, be a whole bunch. I think as long as the Trump administration is there, I think we're going to continue to have upheavals in the Department of, of Ed. I think the international students... Uh, that's going to continue to be an issue with, you know, the the international students coming in and paying full boat for tuition, whereas in universities using that to keep their bottom lines in the green. I, I think that's going to continue to be a problem. Yeah, it's it's a risk. It's it's always been a risk, but it feels really risky now with that population of international students starting to decline for lots of reasons. Mm-hmm. And and we had a lot of students from coming in from China to get degrees. Yeah. And with the increased emphasis, the trade wars that are happening, increased emphasis on background checks. Is any of this warranted? Yeah, probably so. But the the timing and the way it's being implemented isn't, it's not going down real smoothly. Let's put it this way. Right. Any other Things you see in the crystal ball. What are some, let me ask you this: What are some uh, any other institutions to watch? You've named a couple of uh, a couple that are doing very innovative things, and I would agree that that those should be on the list. Any other institutions you want to put on that list of ones to watch in a good way? <laughs> well, I, I I think some of them to watch. I think the the decision that's going to come down from Harvard with the lawsuit there. Uh, I think this is going to be very interesting. That one has, to me, has the potential of going all the way to the Supreme Court. And who knows? I think it will. Yeah. Yeah. And who knows what's going to happen with that, with the, the current makeup of the court. The other one to look at, I think, are the HBCUs. I think there could be some really good things to come out of the HBCUs over the next few years. Uh, no idea what it is, but the crystal ball just kind of you said HBCUs, and I, I'd love to see continue to see them do do well. All universities have issues, but I'd really love to see them continue to do well and even do better. Well, in uh, December of 2019, we'll come back and um, and see if your predictions in your crystal ball were right. Well, we, we may not be able to do that because, you know, academics don't like accountability. That's true. That's true. That's true. I have to say, I like being on this side of things. I like doing the interviewing. It's fun. You're welcome to come back anytime. I, you know, <laughs> okay. th- thank you so much for, for doing this. It's been a lot of fun. That concludes today's episode. And thanks to Deb Maui for helping me with this podcast. And a special thank you to all our listeners for tuning in to us in this, our first year of podcasts. Our first episode of 2019 features Tom Netting of C-SPEN, the Central State's private education network, which represents schools nationwide to public policymakers in Washington and throughout the nation. In this first podcast of the year, we'll talk about what to expect coming out of Washington for 2019 with the new Congress and the NEGREG process focusing on accreditation and innovation, including credit hours and online education. You won't want to miss this one. And thanks again for everyone for a great 2018 and look forward to seeing you in 2019. If you like this podcast, please take a minute to subscribe to the show. And if you're listening on the Apple Podcast app, would you please take a moment to give us a rating and review? You can find out more information and show notes at changinghighered.com. And if you have guests and or other topics you'd like to hear about, please email us at podcast at changinghighered.com to let us know. Remember, creating sustainable higher ed institutions requires three things. Taking a holistic view of your institution, 
aligning strategies, structures, and processes, and ensuring stakeholders are attuned to where you're going. Without any of those three things, you won't get your institution where you want it to go. Until next time.